On today's episode of Talk of Him, we'll talk about why sinners were drawn to Jesus. And we also talk about how Jesus was homeless, and in reality, we are all homeless, and what we can do to emulate Jesus in helping eliminate burden in those lives of others that are struggling. All that and more this week. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Talk of Him, where we talk of all things Jesus Christ as we find Him in the scriptures. That was such See a good tie into our study yeah, guide, totally a little is. marketing brand. Here with Gaina Lynn. How are things going? Excited and cast free. Thank yes. you for all the prayers. They are being felt. Went to the doctor yeah. today, and the doctors are like, Whoa, you're ahead of schedule. I'm like, It's Boom. our talk of him viewers that are praying. Oh, I appreciate thank it. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Let's recognize some people. Yeah, we have kind of a first time. Yeah. experience. We have some guests in the studio today that we're able to do a little giveaway during yeah. Christmas, and we're excited to have Diane, Kathy, Cheryl, and Joyce Lynn. Did I say it right? Joyce Lynn. With a name like Gaina Lynn, I feel very <laughs> sensitive, especially to those that have Lynn in their name. So we are excited to have some Talk of Him yeah. viewers with us in the studio yeah. and fill their spirit and support already. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Today, our scripture chapters that we're sort of going to be referring to, Matthew 8, Mark 2 through 4, and Luke 7. And these chapters give us a unique opportunity to really consider how Jesus viewed and treated people that were on the fringes. Now, we know when you think of that on the fringes, you, you usually think of poor and needy, and we have a lot of interactions with Jesus and how he treated those people. But I like to focus on how he treated people on the fringes spiritually. Mm -hmm. And there's a great— Because that feels very relevant yeah, to, for sure. to his, a lot to of To his us. mission. I mean, if you think about the proclaimed mission of Jesus via the uh, angel at the beginning, right, he will come and save his people from their mm -hmm. sins. I mean, so this his, his ministry to people on the spiritual fringes does sort of characterize the crux of his mission. Yes. Um, and so— uh, many people, as we know, didn't like the way Jesus, I don't know, hung out with sinners. Here's something. It triggered them. Yeah, Mark 2, 15 through 17, and this is in our Find Him study guide. At least these are the verses that we sort of uh, reference. As Jesus sat at meat in his house, many publicans and sinners sat also together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. I just want to pause there, and I want us to think about that those last three words, they followed him. Publicans and sinners, they followed him. And the question that came to my mind as I was reading through this again was, why would sinners mm. choose to follow Jesus? And the follow-up question in my mind was, do sinners feel drawn in a similar way to me? To hang out with it, not, not to sin and party with me, you know what I mean? But do they feel drawn to me in that same sort of like, I don't know, healing or loving way. And so, any thoughts on that? I just feel like as we consider the diversity of our audience, our own yeah. family experiences, I was just having a conversation taping a Turtle House Fireside about the fact that I don't, I don't have the responsibility to judge what my neighbor did the night before, right. but do they feel invited and safe in showing up on Sunday morning, regardless right. on Saturday night, what happened? Mm -hmm. And do they feel like there's a space to sit with me yeah. to worship? Because aren't we all on yeah. that conversion path? Well, because isn't it interesting that Jesus obviously didn't condone their behavior. Right. Right? And yet— The invitation is for right, everyone. They still wanted to be with them, mm -hmm. even though he didn't agree with their behavior. They still wanted to be with him. Because who is he? He's love. So, it's just, yeah. it's just so worth emulating and right. thinking about for me. Right, I love that. Continuing on these same verses, Mark 2, 16 and 17. When the scribes and Pharisees saw him eat with publicans and sinners, they said unto his disciples, How is it that he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners? And then when Jesus heard it, he said, Hey, newsflash. <laughs> <laughs> they that are whole need no, don't need a physician. Only they that are sick need a physician, right? But here's the fact. We're all sick. We're all sick to one degree or another. Mm -hmm. We all need the great physician. Mm -hmm. And when we label others as less than ourselves in any way, we are usually withholding our love and acceptance for them. Uh, Elder Glenn L. Pace said something that I really loved. He said this, we know many wounds are self-inflicted, okay, no, no doubt. 
People do it to themselves. I do it to myself all the time. I hurt myself through my poor choices. Many wounds are self-inflicted and could have been avoided simply by obeying gospel principles. However, to shrug it off as their problem is not acceptable to the Lord. Although he does not condone sin, his arms are always open to the repentant He's sinner. He's always merciful. Oh, so beautiful. This also reminded me of that favorite uh, or famous talk from Elder Holland, one of my favorites. Mm. Uh, it's called, Are We Not All Beggars? from conference uh, October 2014. So good. He says, don't we all cry out for help and hope and, an hope and answers to prayers? Don't we all beg for forgiveness for mistakes we have made and troubles we have caused? Don't we all implore that grace will compensate for our weaknesses, that mercy will triumph over justice, at least in our case? So both Jacob and King Benjamin, you recall in, in 2 Nephi 9 and Mosiah 4, both taught these beautiful truths that I think can be distilled down to a truth statement that we taught once last year, but it was that there's no room for a superiority complex in the gospel of Jesus Christ, just none. And you know, if, you're, if you find yourself in that headspace where you're kind of feeling yeah. judgy, it, it reminded me of my recent experience of needing an ambulance mm. and how many times I have to pull over for the other ambulances yeah. that are, you know, I'm trying to get somewhere and all of a sudden there's there's an emergency vehicle right. going by until I was the one in the emergency yeah. vehicle. Mm. And I just think sometimes, but by the grace of God go I. Right. <laughs> right. If you find yourself feeling like you can judge others, Maybe you haven't needed someone to pick you up and put you in the back of that ambulance and or get you Or at least there. you're not remembering. Or you're not remembering. <laughs> yeah. But I promise you there will be a day, and the day that you need it, you're going to be so grateful that you know how to like reach out to a bishop or a faith friend and call that 911 call and get the help to get to yeah. where you need to go. That was my analogy. Well, I have two comparisons. Okay. Bragging about how, how, how we're so much more spiritual than others is like bragging about being less sick than someone mm -hmm. else. And there's not much to brag about. Right. I'm less sick than you, but right. you're still sick. Or it's like bragging, this is what I like to tell my classes, it's like bragging about going to hell more slowly than someone <laughs> else. <laughs> it's like, are we really bragging about that right now? Yes, that is clickbait. We are all going to hell. <laughs> I'm going to hell slower than you mm -hmm. are, right. right? There's nothing to brag about right. that. We're all going there together without Jesus Christ. But don't you think we do it subconsciously? Like maybe 100%. we're not overtly 100%. calling a friendly and like so-and-so right, right, right. on my street is going there faster. Yeah. But I think subtly we have a sense of like, I'm okay, yeah. and you're in trouble. And that yeah. gives us a sense of safety. For sure. It's got to be a conscious effort on our part most of the time, especially if we're not struggling with anything super heavy. But we've just got to remember, we all equally need Jesus Christ. Just seriously, we all equally need Jesus mm -hmm. Christ. And so my question to consider as we finish up this part is just how can viewing everyone on this planet, including myself, as equally dependent upon Jesus Christ help me become the type of person that Jesus was? where those who are struggling with sin and darkness are sort of inexplicably drawn to me. And to follow up with that, remember that if those who are struggling with sin avoid me like the plague, <laughs> then I'm probably not emulating or emanating Jesus very well. Can I just say that's not true about you? I feel <laughs> like you, one of the things I appreciate about you, and I feel like our viewers have seen it on camera, but I have felt it as a friend that you have taken your own journey of being picked up in the ambulance. Mm. And because of that, you have been able to sucker your students, mm. our viewers, and others because you've been honest and vulnerable about your own journey. Well, I, I, that's very nice of you. And I have been in the spiritual ambulance many, many times. Yeah. And so who am I to judge? Yeah. I, I do feel like sinners want to hang out with you in all the good ways. <laughs> in all the good ways. <laughs> okay, I, I think that's clickbait. Sinners okay. want to hang out with you. John. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're going to kind of build on this idea of everyone needing that grace yeah. and Jesus in their life. But instead of within the context of sinning, as all of us are sinners, we're going to talk about it in the context of Jesus being homeless and all of us being homeless. That's such a great angle. I love this verse, and it's just a quick verse, but for our viewers, you know I like to find that like one little verse gem mm. and stay there and ponder on it, not necessarily get through a whole chapter, but just stay right. in the one. So this is Matthew 8, 20. And Jesus saith unto him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, 
but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And I think about how humble Jesus was at his birth and how he continued through his mortal ministry in humility, not in the best house, yeah. not driving the new Tesla, but in total humility. And I love what Elder Holland said about this in our are we not all beggars? Jesus' first foremost Masonic duty would be to bless the poor, including the poor in spirit, from the beginning of his ministry. Jesus loved the impoverished and the disadvantaged in an extraordinary way, kind of going back yeah. to what we started this sure. whole episode with, right? Mm -hmm. That he sat with the sinners. He was born into the home of two of them and grew up among many more of them. We don't know all the details of his temporal life, but he once said, foxes have holes and birds have nests but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Apparently, the creator of heaven and earth and all things that in them are was, at least in his adult life, homeless. So I just think it's as cool you consider that, yeah, that here mm. the Savior of the world who created the world mm. didn't have a place. And then this is the rest of this quote that I just think is so beautiful. Down through history, poverty has been one of humankind's greatest and most widespread challenges. Its obvious toll is usually physical, but the spiritual and emotional damage it can bring may even be more debilitating. In any case, the great Redeemer has issued no more persistent call than for us to join Him in lifting his, this burden from the people. As Jehovah, He said, He would judge the house of Israel harshly because the spoil of the needy in, is in your houses. And I think of the recent news on the earthquake in, in Turkey, Turkey and Syria, and the images of that. I mean, I think that's the most extreme version of that. But mm -hmm. I know in our own family, in 32 years of marriage, we have been both unemployed and underemployed. Right. And underemployment felt almost sure. more uncomfortable because it felt like the unemployment, yeah. there was a sense of rallying and support and people kind of knew. And so all of a sudden we'd get stuff dropped on the front porch, right? Mm. But the underemployment was a poverty that felt like an everyday experience that I was trying to navigate and paying the bills and looking normal or whatever that was. I almost feel like that's more common than, yeah. and I'm, I, don't, I know I'm not dismissive of, at all of, technical poverty level sort of right. living status, but under, how did you call it? Underemployment. Underemployment is, is, especially in today's society yeah. and economy, right? It's just like, it seems to be harder and harder just to- Fill up the tank <laughs> of gas and, right? And it's easy to feel underemployed. Right. Even though we have so much. Right, yeah. the dozen eggs and yeah. what it's costing yeah. now. Yeah. And so I think what Elder Holland is saying about how that burden is almost debilitating, mm. it made me stop and think about how if the Jehovah judgment that you were to like label as the like top billing was that the house of Israel is ignoring those within the house that are struggling with poverty, mm. What can we each do? Maybe we mm. can't get on an airplane and fly across the world to help those that have survived an earthquake. Yeah. But I was thinking about some of the things we've done as a family, and I hope it's kind of a jumping off point for our viewers to think about yes. how can we relieve some burden? Mm. And maybe it looks like your neighbor's fine because you don't think that they're unemployed, yeah. you know? So one of the things we used to do is be able to go serve Thanksgiving dinner to the homeless shelter. And my kids every year were excited about that. The mm. first year, they weren't sure. And after that, it, it changed their perspective. Um, I also, it wasn't bribe, but I would say <laughs> during Halloween, I would invite my kids to like fill a pretty good hefty bag of candy they wanted to keep but everything else, we would take it down yeah. and, and donate it. That's um, awesome. But I also remember— <laughs> That's also good for dental bills. It for your is. Family. It is. <laughs> it is. Uh, we went through an unemployment time, and some gift cards would just show up. And I remember one week when Rob had interviewed and interviewed and was just not getting the job. And I felt poor in spirit just because it just felt like wall, wall, disappointment, disappointment. And I said, we don't have anything really to give. We had no extra anything. Mm. So we took one of the gift cards we had been given and we went to the unemployment line and gave it to someone. That's cool. And in that moment, it felt like we had extra to give because we had two gift cards, right? Mm. And so sometimes I think we make it big. Yeah. Like we're going to eliminate yeah. poverty for a whole <laughs> right. zip code or <laughs> right. build a school in Africa. Right. 
But have you had anything that comes to mind? I know you've shared a few things on the show, but yeah. that you've done to kind of give back and alleviate burden. Yeah, I, lo- I love I love what you've also talked about uh, paying for people in the drive through behind yeah, you. Yeah, it's my like favorite. That. Those are just such, such small things. Um, my my I've mentioned this before on the show, but my family, my boys and I, and my wife and I, we we have a tradition, and all of our vehicles we have in our center console something we call hobo cash. Oh. Yeah, and we just uh, whenever we see it's a good idea because yeah. I don't always have cash. Right, and so whenever I get cash, I never get cash right, but whenever right. I do, it goes straight to my center console. Oh, I love that. And we have a store near our house where it always has a variety of homeless people, and. When I don't, when we don't have time, we'll usually give, like you said, a few a few dollars, right? Mm-hmm. You don't have to feel like you gotta. If we all take a turn together, right, and, and a shift, as it were, in, in helping these individuals, we're gonna take care of them. Mm-hmm. But when I do have time, there's a Wendy's right across the street, and my boys have done this too, where we'd be like, hey, do you, do you wanna? Would you like a meal if I don't have cash, for instance? And how many times we've they've been like, well, sure. Be like beef or chicken. What's your favorite drink? Okay, I'll be right back. I you just swing that. and come back and. So we've done that. So all my boys, last time I was with my son, you know, he took me out to lunch for my birthday. And we were pulling out. And he was like, oh, hobo cash. He just saw someone there. And, he, and in the center console of his car, he had some money and handed it to the individual. And I just thought it's a, it's a good at least something to, to keep us in awareness. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think, too, it's just like you were talking about in the sin, mm. right? I know because of our experience in mortality that we've been there. We've yeah. been on that other side. And to feel like there's an opportunity we have in the smallest of ways to give back, I think yeah. it keeps us in that connection of we're all brothers and sisters, we're all beggars, yep. and we're all homeless. And we're all spiritually, I, I, I like this as a metaphor as well, we're all spiritually homeless without Jesus. In other words, we can't return to our heavenly home without Jesus Christ yeah, and his I atoning grace and his constant intervention mm-hmm. and his help. Mm-hmm. And so uh, there's no room for a superiority complex right. anywhere in the right. gospel We're of all Jesus sinners Christ. and we're all homeless. We're all sinners, we're all beggars, we're all homeless. So I let's treat each other with Great. kindness. Let's do our invitation. Do this it. week, we'd like you to just consider and evaluate the relationships that you have with people that maybe you struggle with, that you don't agree with, that maybe it's easy to fill that support superiority that mm-hmm. you we've talked about today. But what can you do to better emulate the love of Jesus, especially in those relationships with people that maybe are choosing different than you, worshiping different than you, can you outreach in some way this week with them? Or maybe it's someone that you pass on the street that you can reach out to and give them a sense of what Jesus would do if they were, if he was there. And we're so grateful you joined us this week on Talk of Him, and we'll see you again next week. Did you like today's episode of Talk of Him? Then like and subscribe. And find us on social media. 